Welcome to this session on messaging middleware. In this session, we'll explore the fundamentals of messaging and how it enables communication in distributed systems. We'll dive into messaging-oriented middleware, MOM, to understand its role in facilitating asynchronous message exchanges. Next, we'll examine, we'll examine the Java Messaging Service, JMS. This is a key API for implementing message, messaging in Java applications. We'll also look at Amazon's cloud messaging services as, a, as an example of, of cloud-based services to see how cloud-based solutions are transforming messaging infrastructure. Finally, we'll discuss the AMQP, the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol, and the importance of MOM middle, middleware highlight, highlighting how different messaging systems can work together seamlessly. So let's start by understanding messaging with a simple example, emailing lists. Think of it as a, as a form of published and subscribed messaging. When I send an email to our course lists, for example, if I send an email to CSE 8104, this module, CSE 8104 at ncl.ac.uk, that message is published to everyone registered for the module. And I don't need to know who will receive it or wait for them to even acknowledge it. So th this, this example highlights some key messaging characteristics. First of all, it's one to many. Where, where a single message reaches multiple recipients. Secondly, it's anonymous. The sender and recipients are not directly linked to each other with an intermediate service managing that communication. Finally, it's asynchronous, meaning, meaning that I don't need to wait for a response. So these principles form the basis of messaging and distributed system, systems allowing for efficient decoupled communication. To understand message-oriented middleware, Let's first recap object-oriented middleware. In all middleware, communication is often unicast, meaning it's one-to-one -one between a client and the server. There's typically one operation executed at a time, and both the sender and the receiver need to be aware of each other and be active simultaneously. In contrast, message-oriented middleware supports multi multicast requests, allowing messages to be sent to multiple components or groups at the same time. Is designed to handle multiple operations in parallel. Um, message oriented middleware is anonymous, meaning the sender doesn't need to know the recipients and they don't have to be active at the same time. This suits systems that need loose integration where components operate independently. Message oriented middleware can also use type messages, allowing request reply patterns to be managed more effectively. So this shift from direct to loose coupled communication enables scalable, flexible architectures within distributed systems. The motivation behind using message-oriented middleware stems from the need to handle events generated by various applications. So many systems today constantly produce messages, for example, stock quotations, advertisements, buy and sell offers, weather updates, traffic conditions, and so on. These events often need to be consumed by other applications. For example, a stockbroker application might consume stock price updates based on certain conditions and then generate sell or uh, buy recommendations. Here, consumer subscribe, consumers subscribe to specific message sources, selecting and filtering messages based on criteria like price changes. A key benefit of message-oriented middleware is that the consumers and producers do, need, do not need to operate simultaneously. Unlike traditional invocation methods, message-oriented middleware enables, en enables asynchronous communication. This allows systems to process and act on messages whenever they are ready. This flexibility supports dynamic and scalable architectures in complex environments. This diagram illustrates an example of a stock exchange ticker using message-oriented middleware. In this scenario, we have a trader. The trader, the trader pushes messages like stock price updates to a channel. This channel acts, acts as a message-oriented middleware. The, the channel distributes the messages to multiple ticker, ticker instances, which represent consumers. And here is how it works. The trader connects to the channel and starts pushing messages. Each ticker subscribes or connects to the channel to receive updates. When a message is pushed by the trader, it is immediately sent through the channel to all connected tickets. Now if, I, now if a ticker disconnects, it temporarily stops receiving updates until it reconnects. So notice that as with 
message oriented middleware this setup allows asynchronous communication where a trader and the tickers or the consumers do not need to be synchronized in real time this approach enables multiple consumers to receive updates from a single producer efficiently illustrating the capabilities and the power of message oriented middleware in distributed message messaging across complicated systems key aspects of message oriented middleware in message-oriented middleware, the concept of initiation defines who triggers the message delivery. For example, in, in, a, in a push mode, think of a weather alert system where updates are sent automatically to users as soon as they are available. Here, the producer pushes information to consumers. In, in a pull mode uh, or a pull, pull model, imagine a stock trading application where the user manually checks for the latest prices. The consumer initiates the request for data uh, and that's the difference between that and push mode. So with a push mode, it's up to the creator of the data to push it to the consumers. In pull mode, the consumer decides when to take the data in. There's also a mixed model. So for example, consider a messaging application where a user might receive a message instantly. That's a push, but can also manually check for missed messages and that would be a pull. So that's, uh, so the first aspect of message oriented middleware is initiation. The second one is intermediation. So this involves the use of intermediaries like message queues or brokers in the message exchange. So, so we add another layer to, to the architecture of the application. For example, in an email system, a server acts as an intermediary. The server stores and forwards messages between senders and receivers. Some message-oriented systems uh, use intermediators to manage message flows, while others might connect producers and consumers directly. Another aspect is subscription. This determines if consumers need to opt in to receive messages. Think of a newsletter subscription. In order to get the newsletter, you must subscribe to, to start receiving emails, which is a typical requirement in systems where consumers must show interest. However, in some social media platforms, public posts might be broadcast to all users without explicit subscriptions. Um, another aspect of message-oriented middleware is delivery guarantee, which is an important aspect for reliability. And we've seen this previously when we looked at, at the, the fundamental principles of message-oriented middleware when we looked at failure models within, within RPC. So, um, so so there are different levels, and these are best effort, firstly. Uh, this res resembles a fire and forget system, for example, a live sports score update that might appear once, but may miss some users if, they're not, if they don't happen to be looking at the time. So that would be best effort. Um, so the other level of, of assurance would be at, le at least once. This is like an email marked as urgent, which might be sent multiple times to ensure delivery potentially creating duplicates at most once could be compared to a one-time password sent via SMS and it is, it is delivered only once or not at all without redundancy. Exactly once is the most reliable, like a payment confirmation that must be received precisely once to avoid du double charges or missed receipt receipts. Other important aspects of message oriented middleware are persistence. This determines how messages are stored uh, for example, in a bank transaction system, uh, persistent messages like transaction records are saved to stable storage to survive system crashes and ensure data reliability. Temporary messages, on the other hand, might be used for something less critical, um, like, uh, like chat messages in a live support system that disappear after a session and aren't saved. Finally, filtering allows systems to manage messages, uh, message flow intelligently. Consider for, consider, for example, a news application that filters updates based on certain user preferences. For example, only sports news for sports enthusiasts or finance updates for investors. Filters can be applied by message type, timestamp or other criteria, allowing the system to deliver relevant messages while ignoring other messages. So this ensures that consumers receive only the information that they need, optimizing both performance and user experience. 
This slide provides a real-world com comparison of two popular message-oriented middleware systems. These are the Corba Notification Service and IBM WebSphere, WebSphere MQ. So by examining these, we hopefully will see how the concepts we discussed earlier, the aspects of message-oriented middleware are applied in actual message-oriented middleware implementations. So starting with initiation, so we see that both systems support both push and pull, pull models, offering flexibility depending on how the messages are intended to be used. Uh, for intermediation, both employ, employ multiple intermediators, allowing for complex message routing and handling across distributed components. Um, subscription is supported in both as well, meaning both con consumers must actively subscribe to channels to receive messages, similar to subscribing to news feeds. Delivery guarantee in both systems uh, can be either at most once or exactly once. Um, this provides different reliability options depending on the needs of the application. It allows for balancing between performance and assurance of delivery. In terms of persistence, both the, both the systems offer the option to persist messages, and this means messages can survive system crashes or choose temporary storage when dur durability isn't that important. Finally, filtering capabilities in both systems allow filtering by header, type or content, this enables message delivery to be tailored according to the specific criteria, um, like only receiving updates relevant to a particular stop or type of news. So this comparison shows that while message-oriented middleware systems vary in their implementation, they often share these core important aspects, which gives you a framework to understand and evaluate uh, other middleware systems, hopefully. So as Java programmers, I think it's very important for us to understand uh, the Java messaging service, JMS. Um, so it is a critical component of the Java platform for messaging, especially for enterprise applications. As part of Java Enterprise Edition JEE, JMS provides a standard API that enables Java-based applications to create, send, receive, and read messages. It's designed to facilitate communication across different components uh, of a distributed application. And this allows them to be loosely coupled, which means that they don't need to be tightly integrated to communicate effectively. This setup makes the system more flexible and adaptable to changes. JMS also ensures communication is reliable. Uh, that's because messages can be persistent. And it's also asynchronous, meaning that components can send and receive messages independently without waiting on each other. In enterprise environments, JMS plays an extremely significant role in enabling scalable, resilient architectures, making it essential for anyone working with Java-based distributed systems. It is a key technology and one of the most widely, widely used technologies in message-oriented middleware today. So here we have a diagram that illustrates the architecture of JMS, the Java messaging service, at the core of JMS is the JMS server. This acts as an intermediary between message senders and message receivers. Um, so in this example, we see two applications, each with its JMS client API. Um, these applications communicate by sending messages to the JMS server. The JMS server has a store and forward mechanism, which decouples senders from receivers. This means that the sender does not need to know who the receiver is, even if they're immediately available uh, to receive the message. Instead, the server holds the message and forwards it when the receiver is already supporting asynchronous communication. An important feature of this architecture is delivery guarantees. So JMS provides mechanisms for message persistence and transactional messaging. So transactional messaging ensures that messages are reliably stored and can survive system crashes or errors. This design makes JMS suitable for building resilient, enterprise-grade, uh, secure applications that require dependable messaging. This slide illustrates two core messaging models in JMS, Publish Subscribe and Point to Point. In Publish Subscribe, uh, the Publish Subscribe model, also known as one-to-many messaging, a publisher sends a message to a central topic Multiple consumers or subscribers can choose to subscribe to this topic. When the publisher sends a message, it, it is automatically delivered to all subscribers. 
A good example of this model is a news feed where updates are sent to all users who have subscribed to that topic. In contrast, the point-to-point -point model operates on a one-to-one -one basis. Here, a sender places a message in a queue and multiple receivers are available to process it. However, only one receiver will actually consume the message. This model is useful, useful in scenarios like task distribution, where a job is added to a queue and one worker picks it up to process, ensuring each message is handled by only one consumer. So these two models give JMS the flexibility to support different communication patterns, depending on application needs, um, broadcasting, broadcasting information with sub published subscribe and targeted single consumer del delivery with point to point. So this slide provides a side by side comparison of the key aspects of JMS queues with JMS topics, which represent the two main messaging models in JMS. Starting with initi initiation, uh, queues support both push and pull models where messages can be pushed to a consumer or pulled as needed. Topics, on the other hand, typically operate in a push-only mode where messages are broadcasted to all subscribers automatically. For intermediation, both queues and topics use multiple intermediators, allowing JMS to route messages through complex distributed systems. In terms of subscription, JMS topics supported, meaning consumers must subscribe to a topic to receive messages. Queues, however, do not use a subscription model since they operate on a one-to-one -one basis. Once a message is received, it is no longer available to other consumers. Delivery guarantee is similar for both, with options for at most once, exactly once delivery, uh, or exactly once delivery, ensuring flexibility in message reliability. Persistence is also an option for both, allowing messages to be stored persistently, which is very important for essential data that must sub survive system failures or temporary if persistence is not necessary. Finally, filtering is available for both queues and topics, allowing messages to be filtered by, head, by header or by type. This enables uh, more selective message delivery based on specific criteria. criteria. This ensures only relevant messages are delivered to consumers. Um, so this comparison highlights how queues and topics are different and how messages are distributed and consumed. This offers flexibility for various application needs. In this slide, we introduce Amazon Cloud Messaging Services. Uh, these are part of the broader concept of cloud computing. Cloud computing is a model that enables web-based utility computing. In the cloud, applications and services run on shared resources. These are provided by large data centers, allowing for scalability and efficient resource utilization. The cloud offers different delivery models, so the three main known delivery models are software as a service. This is where applications are accessed over the internet and examples of them are Google Apps or Salesforce. Uh, platform as a service. This provides a platform for, deliver, to, for developing and deploying applications. applications. An example of this is the OpenShift platform as a service uh, developed by Red Hat. Uh, also, we have infrastructure as a service. This offers fundamental computing resources like storage and networking. Um, so Amazon Web Services provides infrastructure as a service through services like EC2 for computation and S3 for storage. Amazon also offers cloud messaging services that align with the messaging models that we discussed. So it, it offers SQS, the, sim the simple queue service. This is a fully managed queuing service that supports asynchronous messaging, uh, asynchronous communication, and is ideal for point-to-point -point messaging. SNS, this is the simple notification service, and is a notification service that enables pub pub publish and subscribe messaging, where messages can be broadcasted to multiple subscribers. So these services allow developers to build scalable decoupled applications in the cloud, um, leveraging Amazon's infrastructure for reliable and efficient messaging. So let's provide a few more details on Amazon's SNS and SQL models for cloud messaging. So starting with SNS, the simple notification service, this is designed for publish subscribe messaging. In this model, clients publish messages to a topic and subscribers can register their endpoints, such as, uh, such as URLs, to receive these messages. 
this setup is ideal for broadcasting messages to multiple consumers, like sending alerts or notifications to multiple systems or users. SQS, the simple queuing service, on the other hand, is a queue-based interaction model suitable for point-to-point -point messaging. Messages in SQS are stored in an eventually consistent collection of replicas, which means there are certain trade-offs. So the trade-offs are no ordering guarantee. So that means that messages may not be delivered in the order that they were sent, which is important to consider for applications that need strict sequencing. Uh, also, something to consider is possible duplicate message delivery. So messages may be de delivered more than once to ensure reliability. So consumers need to be de uh, so consumers need to be designed to handle potential duplicates. Both SNS and SQS support re relatively short messages and use an HTTP query interface, making them easy to integrate into web-based and distributed applications. These models offer flexible options for designing scalable decoupled architectures in the cloud. Let's take a look at the SQS interface, uh, which operates through HTTP requests using URLs with query parameters. These requests are used to manage and interact with queues, providing flexibility and control over message handling. So some of the key actions available Create queue and delete queue allows us to create a new queue or delete an existing one, giving full control over the queue lifecycle. Then we have list queues, lets us retrieve a list of all queues associated with one account, with our account, uh, useful for managing multiple queues in a system. Send message is used to add a message to a queue, enabling asynchronous communication between distributed components. Receive message allows a consumer to retrieve messages from the queue. An example of this in, in URL format is, is the one shown in the slide where parameters specify actions like receiving messages. Delete message removes a message from the queue once it has been processed, ensuring that it won't be uh, re-delivered. So here we explain the SQS messaging lifecycle. Um, so we provide details of how messages are handled within Amazon's SQS service. First, the send message action occurs when a sender places a message labeled here as M into the queue. SQS automatically distributes this message redundantly across multiple SQS servers, ensuring reliability and durability so the message is not lost if a server goes down. Next, the receive message action allows a receiver to retrieve the message from the queue. When a consumer receives a, retrieves a message, it remains in the queue but becomes temporarily invisible to other consumers for the duration of the visibility timeout. This timeout gives the consumer a window to process the message without the risk of it being delivered to another receiver. If the message is not processed within this period, it becomes visible again in the queue, making it available for another attempt at delivery. This approach ensures that messages are reli reliably processed while preventing duplicate processing uh, and this supports robust asynchronous communication within distributed systems in general. So here we continue from our previous, previous slide, adding the final step, which is deleting the message after processing. So finally, once the message has been successfully processed, the consumer issues a delete message command. This action removes the message from the queue and it is eventually deleted from all servers, ensuring that it won't be re-delivered to any other consumer. So this life cycle, sending, receiving, with visibility control and deleting, helps ensure that messages are processed reliably and only once. So let's put SQS and SNS side by side, comparing their aspects. aspects. Um, so initiation, SQS uses a pull model, where consumers pull messages from the queue, while SNS uses a push model, pushing messages directly to subscribers. Intermediation, both services operate with a single level of intermediation, meaning they each rely on a central system, either a queue or a topic to manage message distribution. Subscription, SNS supports subscriptions, allowing multiple consumers to subscribe to topics and receive notifications. SQS, however, does not require subscription because messages are consumed individually by pulling from the queue. Delivery guarantee in SQS, messages have at least once delivery guarantees, 
meaning that messages may be delivered more than once, but are guaranteed to be delivered at least once. In SNS, the delivery guarantee is best effort, meaning it depends on the consumer's reliability and could vary. Persistence SQS supports persistent message storage, meaning messages can survive system crashes. SNS, however, is temporary, delivering notifications without persistent storage. Finally, filtering, neither SQS or SNS support message filtering directly. So this means that all messages are treated the same without additional selection criteria. Um, we also note that there are other cloud messaging services. Uh, examples of those are Microsoft's Azure Service Bus. This combines queue and subscriber models, uh, offering similar cloud-based messaging capabilities. Now let's introduce AMQP. This is the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. So AMQP is widely adopted standard for ensuring interoperability among messaging middleware platforms, such as using uh, Apache Cupid uh, with Microsoft Azure. So AMQP is to message middleware what SMTP is to email services. It provides a standardized way for different systems to communicate effectively. AMQP operates as a wire level protocol, meaning it defines the behavior of both the client and server at a low level, ensuring consistency and reliability in message handling. It uses self-describing binary messages that include headers and a payload, making them easy to interpret regardless of the system. The message format is also independent of language and provider, allowing for seamless communication across diverse platforms. One of AMQP's strength is its flexibility, as it can support both published prescriber models and queue-based interaction models. So this first facility makes uh, it suitable for a wide range of applications, including distributed systems and cloud-based messaging solutions. So overall, AMQP standardization enables different messaging services and systems to work together reliably, making it a key protocol in interoperable messaging middleware. So uh, here we summarize the key aspects of AMQP. First of all, intermediation. AMQP supports multiple intermediaries, allowing complex routing and message handling between different systems. Uh, subscriptions are supported. This is essential for published subscribe models where multiple consumers can, can listen to specific, specific message channels. Delivery guarantee, AMQP uh, provides flexibility here, allowing for at least once, at most once, or exactly once delivery. So uh, this enables users to choose the level of reliability that best suits their application's needs. Uh, persistence, so messages in AMQP are, are persistent, so that means that they're, they're stored and can survive system failures, which is very important for applications that require message durability. And finally, filtering. AMQ does allow filtering based on headers, type, and content, giving systems fine-grained control over which messages are delivered to which consumers. Additionally, AMQP messages carry not only the payload, but also processing and routing information. This embedded data enables the middleware to make intelligent routing decisions and enhance messaging inter uh, interoperability. However, the specific guarantees and behaviors will depend, will depend on the underlying message middleware implemented. Finally, let's take a look at some future considerations uh, in messaging middleware. So we'll look at some important trends and emerging areas that will shape the evolution of messaging systems into the future. Firstly, IoT messaging protocols. An example of that is MQTT. So these are becoming critical as the Internet of Things expands. IoT devices often operate in environments with limited power and network resources, such as remote sensors or smart home devices. Uh, in such situations, Protocols like MQTT are designed to be lightweight, allowing these devices to communicate efficiently with minimal data overhead. Uh, and this is particularly invaluable in IoT ecosystems, where we have thousands of devices that might need to send small messages very frequently. Another important aspect uh, of, of messaging middleware going to the future is message security. Uh, as more sensitive data moves through messaging systems, Ensuring security and privacy becomes very important. So we use techniques like end-to-end -end encryption uh, that can protect message content from being accessed by unauthorized parties, securing the data throughout the journey from sender to receiver. 
Finally, evolving cloud services. So these are continually being developed, enhancing messaging capabilities, allowing developers to build more advanced and scalable systems. Um, so now cloud providers are offering highly configurable messaging services that integrate with other cloud-based tools. Uh, they support complex message routing and, pro and provide monitoring and analytical capabilities that provide real-time insights. So these services typically can handle massive scale data, making them suitable for global applications. So as cloud technology evolves, we can expect even more features aimed at simplifying, securing and scaling message based communication. In summary, these areas, um, IoT protocols, enhanced security and evolving cloud services are essential for building modern, modern uh, messaging systems that are efficient, secure and future ready.